Paula Theeuwen. I'm a PhD student at the Deech Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. In this video, you will see the presentation I gave based on my literature thesis I did before doing my master's degree at the University of Amsterdam. This thesis has now been published as a review in the Scientific Journal of Molecules. The link to this review can be found in the description. In this video, we will take a tour through the periodic table and see how various metal ions can coordinate to the so-called dipyranato ligand. This is an organic molecule consisting of two parallel units that can coordinate to a variety of metal ions. In this video, I will also talk about how the photophysical properties of these types of complexes can be tuned for photomedicine. And I specifically looked at their application in the field of photodynamic therapy. At the end of my presentation, I will also give a few suggestions for possible future research in this field. If you have any questions regarding my review or this presentation, you can post them in the comments or you can contact me directly. The metal coordination effects on the photophysics of dipyrin complexes. And dipyrin complexes look like these ones over here. Now, what I looked at uh, coordinate these with different metals, uh, what is the influence? Middle block shows the photophysics that I will be discussing the application as photosensitizer drugs of these complexes in photodynamic therapy. What is photodynamic therapy exactly? So it starts with the injection of a drug called a photosensitizer into the body. And then preferably this, this drug accumulates in the diseased tissue. So photodynamic therapy is a therapy which can treat cancer and tumors. If these tumors are in a specific place, you can irradiate this position in the body. We specifically target this tissue, which gives it a sort of a dual selectivity. Because of this dual selectivity, uh, this technique is relatively non-invasive, especially if you compare it to like chemotherapy. And with this Jablonski diagram, I want to show the basic concept that's applied to the, the processes that occur before photodynamic therapy. And it all starts with the irradiation of the photosensitizer with visible light. Light. And I say visible light because if you want to treat someone, you want to have light between a certain range, which is 600 to 800 nanometers. This is called the therapeutic range. If you go outside of this range, you may not have a large tissue penetration that is possible, or you don't have enough energy for other processes to occur. So it starts with the irradiation of photosensitizers, and then you can get the singlet stay populated. After that, intersystem crossing, which is the purple arrow, can occur under the formation of the triplet state. And this triplet state is the one that can react uh, with the molecular oxygen that is present in the tumor cells in a process called triplet-triplet annihilation. And in this process, singlet oxygen is produced. And the singlet oxygen is very reactive and it can react with the biomolecules in the surroundings of this photosensitizer and in this way, hopefully induce cell death. So this intersystem crossing is very important process because this is the process that will generate the triplet states. But this intersystem crossing has to compete with fluorescence and non-radiative decay processes of the singlet state. So that is why the fluorescence should not be too high because it's a competing process. However, it should also not be zero, then you would have problems with imaging. So a balance needs to be found in that, but this still means that chromophores are necessary, which absorb in the visible light, which has a little bit of fluorescence. So the most important parameters that are into play here are the triplet quantum yield and the triplet lifetime. Especially these parameters need to be enhanced to get the desired properties for photodynamic therapy. How these parameters can be enhanced and how the metal coordination influences this was the topic of my thesis. The reason that me and Zoe chose for uh, dipyrin complexes is because of the large amount of information that is available on their boron analogs. These are called bodipes and they look like this complex over here. So this is an example of a bodipe. Some parameters are shown over here. So it shows that the fluorescence quantum yield is quite high, 0.7. And this is also one of the reasons that these complexes are being used as fluorescent probes. But more recently, they are also being investigated as photosensitized for photodynamic therapy by uh, changing substituents on this complex. And one of the observations that was made in research into these complex was that apparently by attaching iodides, the photophysical properties 
were greatly enhanced in the favor of photodynamic therapy. We can compare some of the parameters. Uh, we see that the fluorescence yield is greatly decreased, but not zero. And we see a redshift in the absorbance. And this is also really nice because higher wavelengths means also you can have larger tissue penetration. So you don't have to worry about uh, only being able to target superficial tumor cells. Another thing is that uh, the singlet oxygen generation rate, which is greatly increased. And this is what is important for photodynamic therapy is this is the uh, compound that causes the cell death. So apparently attaching iodides is very useful for applications as photosensitizers. But the question is, why does this happen? And this can be explained by something called the heavy atom effect. By attaching these heavy atoms, iodides, uh, something called the spin-orbit coupling is enhanced as well. And according to this formula, the spin-orbit coupling is also related to the efficiency of the intersystem crossing. In general, this spin-orbit coupling is very difficult to determine because many parameters are involved. For example, orbital shapes of the triplet state and the singlet state, the occurrence of charge transfer, electron density distributions of these orbitals, but also the atomic number according to this relation. Apparently, by attaching heavy atoms to your complex, uh, the intersystem crossing can be enhanced. Another way to do this is by using metal coordinations. Because metals, metal ions, are also quite heavy. An added bonus of using metal coordinations is the, the increase of the tunability of these complexes, because you can add different co-ligands, different substituents, but also different metals. And that is what I focused on. So for this, let me go to the periodic table, a very important table, as you all know. In gray, I show the metals or the elements that have either not shown to make complexes with diapirins, or they have not shown interesting photochemistry, that, and these I will not discuss today. But in colored are the ones that I do want to discuss today. These can be divided into four groups, and this will be the structure of my presentation as well. So first of all, I want to discuss these five metal ions over here. These are known to form tris diapirin complexes, so octahedral complexes with the diapirins. The second group is these four metal ions over here. They are known to form either square plane or tetrahedral configurations with diapirin complexes. They have some similar concepts apply to these complexes. Uh, the next is these three, zinc, gallium, and indium. Divalent zinc and trivalent gallium and indium have filled D orbitals, which allows them to have similar properties. So I will group these as well and discuss them, mainly because, well, apparently these D10 configurations have some interesting chemistry. The fourth one I will discuss are some P-block coordinations with diapirins. I will only quickly go over them, especially this aluminium diapirin complexes I will discuss. Ruthenium, rhodium, rhenium, osmium, and iridium metal ions, which form octahedral complexes. Only a few, few papers have been published about these diapirin complexes with these metals, and even fewer have, have shown investigated applications as photosensitizers for PDT. I will not really go into much detail of these papers, but I do want to tell you about complexes with other ligands. The concepts that apply for these complexes with other ligands could maybe be applied to diapirin complexes as well. Several enhancement techniques were published on these other complexes. And then I wonder if these same enhancement techniques can also be used there. And these ligands involve polypyridyl ligands such as phenanfolin, bipyridine, and terpyridine. And I want to discuss these for a bit. So in general, metal complexes often show low absorption in the visible range and short-lived triplet excited states. And this is not what we want for photosensitizing applications. Well, to explain the short-lived triplet states is because inter-system crossing is enhanced, but also other non-radiative processes are also enhanced. And this depletes the triplet excited state, causing low uh, triplet lifetime. So there has to be a way to enhance this uh, in order to use these as photosensitizers. So one way to do this is by attaching bulky antenna groups to the, sides of, to the sides of the ligands. So an example is, is Coumarin, which uh, absorbs in the visible range. 
So this allows for strong absorption in the visible range, which is what we want. So if we look at the Jablonski diagram, we can see here the absorption of a photon uh, under the formation of an intraligand state. And this is what this antenna does. It introduces these intraligand states. Intersystem crossing between the interligand singlet state to the triplet interligand state is not efficient at all because the antenna is so far away from the metal center that it doesn't feel this heavy atom effect anymore. Instead, it can transform into a metal to ligand charge transfer state. This is efficient as it is an allowed transition going from a singlet to a singlet. If we go further in the diagram, we see intersystem crossing between the singlet MLCT state to the triplet MLCT state, which is also efficient because now we again are closer to the metal and the heavy atom effect applies again. In this way, the triplet quantum yield is enhanced. And this is again what we want. One downside of this is that phosphorescence is still a thing. So phosphorescence is still there, is depleting the triplet state, causing short-lived triplet excited states. So the next thing is to think about how can we enhance the triplet lifetime. And that can be done by lowering the triplet interligand state until it's almost at the same level at the triplet MLCT state. And in that way, an equilibrium is made with these, well, if this is done here, you have an equilibrium between these two states. And that has been shown to increase the triplet lifetime. It has been shown with the ligand of pyrene. The phosphorescence is then also quenched because now this interligand state, which is involved, again, doesn't feel the heavy atom effect that much. And therefore also the phosphorescence for this state is not enhanced as much. With these techniques, it was shown that the absorption was enhanced in the visible range and the triplet lifetime could be enhanced as well. So these are, these are great results for these other ligands. But now the question is, can we use this for dipermian ligands as well? But first, I also want to concepts that were applied to complex, a ruthenium complex called TLD1433. This has entered clinical trials. And this shows the promise of using these metal complexes as photosensitizers. As you can see on the right, this is the Jablonski diagram that applies to this compound and it has some similar concepts that apply as I discussed before. And in my thesis, I described some uh, ruthenium, rhenium and iridium complexes, dipermian complexes. However, not much research has been done into them yet. So much more research needs to be done to, uh, in order to say anything about uh, uh, the value of these type of complexes. However, initial results already showed that they do, do show singlet oxygen generation. So these two ruthenium complexes over here have been tested in the context of PDT and these iridium complexes as well. And they did show already some promise. My expectation is again, that if the concepts that have been used for the other ligands, if they would have been applied to these uh, complex as well, maybe um, some progress can still be made. So the next uh, group is the nickel, copper, palladium and platinum complexes. Yeah, I will quickly go over them as they are not that important for the thing I want to convey to you guys. But the thing is, these metal ions, these divalent metal ions are either D8 or D9 metals. So copper is D9 and the others are D8. And it is generally known for these type of metal ions that I want to form square planar complexes. Maybe this diagram looks familiar to you all. This means that crystal field splitting energy of, of this type of complexes is larger for square planar configurations and therefore these are preferred. And the preference for the square planar configuration increases so it becomes more strict when you go down in the periodic table. So from nickel to palladium to platinum. This is important as we go to Diperion complexes. Whereas in diperion complexes, we have these substituents on the alpha positions of the diperions. This can be protons, but these can also be larger, such as methyls or phenyls. And as you can imagine, these have a steric interaction between those. And so something needs to happen to accommodate the strain. The things that can happen is, uh, for example, an intermediate geometry between square planar and tetrahedral. And this is what happens for this first row metals, this nickel and copper. 
metal ions. This can be shown by this figure over here. So if the R groups over here increase in size, also the dihedral angle becomes larger. However, for palladium and platinum, this preference for scrap planar is way stricter. So in that way, yeah, we still want to keep this scrap planar configuration and in order to accommodate these alpha side groups, different kind of configuration is made where the diperin planes get a little bit of a curve between them and which they, they lose their coplanarity. For both of these, it has been shown that losing the coplanarity has influence on the photophysical properties. However, for these type of complexes, these were not shown yet. This nickel and copper diperin complexes might show some promise for photodynamic therapy application because these metal ions are much cheaper and more abundant than the second and third row transition metals I discussed before. It would be valuable to research these. And this has been done in one paper I could find by Cargis et al. last year. Uh, but these didn't show any promise for photodynamic therapy, actually. Th these complexes, this, uh, this complex uh, with iodides on the sides and uh, with the nickel or the copper were only poorly emissive and they barely produced any singlet oxygen. And the reason I want to mention this paper is because I think that if they maybe would have used protons instead of methyls on the alpha substituents, maybe their results would have been a little bit better. And that's because this geometry is important for the spin states. If you have a tetrahedral D8 configuration, as you can see here on the left, you would have a triplet ground state. If you would have a scrap planar configuration, you would have a singlet ground state. And a singlet ground state is needed for photodynamic therapy. So if you would deviate too much from the scrap planar configuration, you may have equilibrium or I, I don't know for sure how this happens, but you can have more of the triplet ground state, which I, I, I don't know, but I think this is not uh, that great for the photophysical properties. So I think they should redo it, maybe see what the influence is uh, if you remove the methyls. Let's go to the next group, the third group, and that is about the, the D10 metals, uh, which are zinc, gallium, and indium. I will mainly focus on the zinc complexes because much more research has been done on these complexes than on the gallium and indium. Very similar concepts apply. In my thesis, I describe a range of zinc complexes with different substituents, different a different substitution on the meso position, also on the alpha position and on the beta position. I will not go over them. You can read my thesis if you want to learn more about these. But I do want to mention two comparisons that can be made to show that the substituent effects are important. The first one is the meso position. When you go from a phenyl group on the meso position to a mesethyl group, the phosphorescence is greatly increased. And this is because this mesethyl group is much more torsionally, is that a word, constrained compared to this phenyl. And in this way, yes, uh, non-radiative decay processes are hampered. The next one is attaching iodides. And we saw this before for bodipes that this could enhance the properties in the favor of photodynamic therapy. We can see that the triplet quantum yield is greatly increased, which is very nice, I would say. And this complex has also been tested in, in the context of PDT, and it has shown a triplet lifetime of 182 nanoseconds, a singlet oxygen quantum yield of 0.5 to 0.6 in toluene. This complex did show a lot of promise for photodynamic therapy. They use concepts in this paper, which I will not discuss, but I do want to mention that this exact nickel and copper analogs did not show any potential yet. So this shows already uh, the influence of a metal. So zinc is, gives great results and nickel and copper does not. Okay, then I want to talk about this triplet lifetime because the triplet lifetimes of these zinc complexes are relatively long. And this is because of the, of the occurrence of a process called symmetry breaking charge transfer, SBCT over here. And in this process, after excitation of this complex, electron transfer occurs, where one diperin ligand becomes positively charged and the other one negatively charged. These ligand-to-ligand -ligand charge transfer states can undergo very efficient inter-system crossing under the formation of a triplet state. And this process results in very, very large triplet quantum yields, which is good for PDT applications. So if you look at the figure on the left, we see uh, an, an emissive singlet state 
And after symmetry breaking charge transfer, non-emissive states are made. So this is also great. You have less competition with fluorescence. This paper, which discusses this, these complexes, also show that when you dis- decrease the polarity of the solvent, some other things happen. So then these ligand to ligand charge transfer states are destabilized and they become larger than the singlet state. So these will not be populated anymore. And then inter-system crossing between the singlet state and triplet state is not efficient anymore. Then the triplet condom yield is also lowered. Another thing besides solvents, also introducing dissymmetry was shown to have a large impact on the photophysical properties. If we look at this complex over here, we have D1 ligand, which is different from the D2 ligand. It has been shown that if you irradiate this D2 ligand, this D2 ligand also emits. And this is seen, can be seen by the blue line, which overlaps with the red line for the heteroleptic version. So the blue line is the homoleptic version with two of these ligands, and the red one is the heteroleptic com- complex. So we see emission from this blue ligand. However, interestingly, if you uh, irradiate the D1 ligand, you can get energy transfer from the D1 to the D2, and the D2 still emits light then. So this is kind of proof of this energy transfer uh, that occurs. It has been shown that introducing this kind of dissymmetry influences the photophysical properties as well. And actually, all of the papers involving these heteroleptic complexes had as a goal to increase the fluorescence in these complexes. For us, as photosensitized for photodynamic therapy, we, we want to lower the fluorescence actually, because when you lower the fluorescence in the process, you can enhance the triplet generation. But knowing about this process does give some information on what can be done to enhance the triplets. So you can see what you don't, what you shouldn't do. This is the symmetry, the, the levels are not at the same level anymore. So for the D1 and the D2, they are not at the same level anymore. And then creating the non-emissive states becomes less efficient. And in that way, the fluorescence is enhanced. But now the great thing is, is that if you would attach, uh, for example, an ethyl group on these sides, the opposite effect occurs. And then these non-emissive states, the generation of the non-emissive states is enhanced even more. So then you would have even lower fluorescence compared to the homoleptic version, and you would have a higher triplet yield as well. So this shows that introducing dissymmetry can also be used for applications as photosensitizers if you use the right substituents. And this greatly increases the opportunity of tunability. By using two different ligands, you have a way larger range that can be tested for the photovisical properties. Now, uh, in due to time, I will quickly go over the P-block DPs. So in my thesis, I describe uh, several P-block DPs with boron, aluminium, gallium, uh, phosphorus, and tin. And these have actually only been investigated on uh, their fluorescence properties or uh, not really on the triplet generation. So for today, uh, these are not uh, that that much uh, uh, important. Um, But I do want to discuss uh, the ALDPs. So aluminium is one step down in the periodic table from boron. Naturally, you would say uh, these LDPs, maybe they have similar properties as these BODPs. And maybe if you would apply the same concepts as have been tested in BODP papers, if you would use them for LDP, maybe they can have these great results as well. However, a very limited amount, limited amount of papers have been dedicated to these LDPs. Uh, there have not been uh, research for that triplet generation at all. So uh, that would be already a great uh, thing to start with. But I do want to uh, mention a few things. So I want to co- for, to give a comparison with BODPs. One paper has published about this N2O2 type dipyrin with the phenyl over here and the, the oxygen also coordinated to the metal. And the difference between BODP and LDP in this case was that the BODPs were tetrahedral and the aluminium dipyrin complexes were square planar. And this square planar coordination allowed for extra octahedral coordination on the actual actual position. For example, oxygen atoms over here, which were from the water. So this is, if you ignore this for a second, this would be the crystal structure. Now we go to the complete crystal structure because it was shown that these oxygens were these oxygens over here, these, 
were also shown to be able to complex with, for example, zinc chloride. And the N2O2 type bond piece were not able to do that because the aluminum oxygen, they were this bond was different from the bode P oxygen bond. So this shows a bit uh, of the uh, difference between bode P's and LDPs. However, besides this, a few articles on these LDPs concerning theoretical, the energy levels and the, some fluorescence, not much information is uh, present on these LDPs. So that is what I wanted to discuss. So then I'm almost done. I want to discuss some future prospects. And I've thought about four ideas on where some more research could be spent. So for each group I discussed, I, uh, I thought of one thing to mention. So for the first group, I think uh, researching heteroleptic ruthenium dipyrin complexes based on principles learned from these other ligands. So for example, polypyridyl complexes can, can maybe show a lot of promise uh, in the field of photodynamic therapy. For the second group, I think uh, substituent effects on the triple generation of nickel dipyrin complexes is a great, great topic to start. So substituent effects on the geometry and therefore also on the spin states of the nickel dipyrin complexes and how this influences photophysical properties, because I didn't understand this completely yet. So maybe this would be a good thing to start. For the third group, this dissymmetry I thought was very interesting. I think this can show a lot of promise. I think some research can be done into introducing dissymmetry as a goal to uh, with the goal to uh, enhance triplet generation. So this has not been done yet. It's only focused on enhancing fluorescence. For the fourth group, the P-block diapyrins, I think it's great to study uh, how triplet generation can be enhanced in all the bees. I think this is a, uh, also a great topic because there has been no research done yet on all the bees and the triplet generation. So to conclude, yeah, this I hope in this literature thesis, I explored research conducted on the photochemistry, the photophysics of metal dipyrin complexes and their application as photosensitizers for PDT. I hope I showed you that this is still an ongoing field where much progress can still be made. And especially by learning from previous research with different ligands, such as the polypyridyl ligands. And I hope I showed that great steps can be made towards the production of dipyrin photosensitized. All things considered, the dipyrin ligand uh, has been shown to be a valuable contender in the search for alternative transition metal photosensitizers, and that it's a great topic to spend more research on. That was it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching my presentation. Uh, in this video, we saw how the dipyrinato ligand can coordinate to a variety of different metal ions across the periodic table. We also saw how their photophysical properties can be tuned for photomedicine by adding different types of substituents. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you have any questions you can post them in the comments or by contacting me directly. Bye!